It's the life as God has it. There is no death in that life. When you believe the gospel, you are obeying the gospel. By doing so, you are obeying God. Your obedience to the instruction in the meeting is what connects you to the flow of the spirit in the meeting. It's what connects you to the flow of the anointing in the meeting. Your prayer life is the temperature of your Christian life. Your faith must be in the blood. The blood of Jesus is something the devil cannot stand. So we've been talking about how to be led by the Spirit of God. And if you remember last week, I began teaching about um, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask somebody sitting next to you, did you listen to the teaching again after service on Sunday? Did you? Get an answer from them. Make sure they answer you. Don't let them run away. If the person is about to carry their eyes, say, look at me, answer me. <laughs> you know, it's important that you listen to the messages after you leave church. All right? So that you can really get a full grasp of what is being said. And you hear again and again and again. And then the word begins to take root. And remember I told you, the first time you hear a teaching is as though uh, the word is being planted. And then the subsequent times you hear it, it's being watered. How many of you know that if you plant a seed, that does not automatically guarantee that it will grow? It has to be watered. So Paul said, Paul planted, I, Paul planted, Apollos watered, and then the Lord gave the what? Come on, talk to me like you have a voice this morning. The Lord did what? The Lord did give the increase. So man, Paul planted. So Paul is a man. So, we began talking about that last week, you know, listening to the voice of the Lord. And, you know, the first thing I'll share with you this morning is that all over the world, the biggest problem of man, and this is a very heavy statement I'm about to make, one of the biggest problem of man is just two words, won't listen. Won't listen. That is... One of the biggest problems man has is his inability to listen. Sometimes it's not even an uh, inability issue. Sometimes it's an unwillingness issue. In other words, the moment a person will not listen, it is very hard to help them, if at all possible. Did you see? And so it's very important that we learn how to listen to the voice of the Lord. To learn how to listen to the voice of the Lord. I repeat it again. One of the greatest problems of man is, is inability and unfortunately sometimes unwillingness to listen. Is unwillingness to listen. In Isaiah chapter 55, and you would have to really use your Bible today. Um, as a pastor, I'm, I'm quite excited about that. That's right. For those of you who always depend on the screen, of course, we love the screen to be on. Don't get me wrong. But on a day such as this, you have to open your Bible. So open your Bible to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. And we are going to read the third verse. Isaiah 55. And we're going to read the third verse. Glory to Jesus. For some of you, it's been a long time you opened your Bible to Isaiah. Ask your neighbor, say, where was the last time that you opened the book of Isaiah? Ask your neighbor for me. When was the last time you opened the book of Isaiah? Get an answer. You should never be afraid of that, your neighbor. Look at them, say, when, when, when? And for some of you who are finding it difficult to locate the book of Isaiah, and particularly the 55th chapter, it is right after chapter 52. <laughs> it's trying to help you. <laughs> it's God. So now, if you have it, let's read together. Want to go? Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Come on, keep reading. That's not all. Yes. Did you see that? 
Incline your what? Yeah. Your ear. To incline your ear means what? Listen. It means listen. Then it goes on to say, hear and your soul shall live. So in other words, it means listening sometimes is a life or death issue. Listening sometimes is a life or death issue. As a matter of fact, when it has to do with eternal life, you need to understand that listening is actually a matter of life and death. The word is nigh thee. Romans 10, 8, 9, and 10. Those three verses. The word is nigh thee. But what says the word is nigh thee? Even in the mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10 says, for it is with the heart. A man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You go to verse 12. He says that that same Lord which is over all, is rich unto all that call on him. 13 says, and therefore whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 13 says, but how shall they call upon him of whom they have not believed? How shall they believe? Except they what? Hear. So notice in the equation, their hearing is pivotal. So Paul is saying you cannot believe on him of whom you have not heard. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5. He therefore that walketh miracles among you. Did you see that? He therefore that ministered to you the spirit and walketh miracles amongst you. Doeth he by the hearing of faith or by the work of the law. He said he doeth it by the hearing. Hearing of it. Not by the works of the law. But by the what? The hearing of it. Now when he says he therefore that ministered to you the spirit there. The spirit there is talking about the life. The life. So now I was saying, how does a man get born again? It's not by doing the law. It is rather by hearing the faith message. The word of Christ. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it means if a person won't listen, then they will forfeit everlasting life. i said say it again. If a person won't listen, then that person will forfeit everlasting life. Everything God is going to do, the ministry of the Spirit, the working of miracles, comes by the hearing of faith. Comes by the hearing of faith. Romans 10, 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So a man will take listening seriously if he wants to have life and enjoy it. You will take listening seriously if you want to have the life of God and you want to enjoy the life of God. You must take listening seriously. Your life with God began with listening. Your life with God will be sustained by listening. I say it again. Your life with God began by listening and your life with God will be sustained by listening. So you got to listen. You've got to listen. You listen to be saved. You will also need to listen to enjoy salvation. To enjoy eternal life. Everything that is supernatural from the Lord has to do with your hearing. Has to do with your hearing. Paul was preaching at Lystra in Acts 14. The Bible says there was a man from verse 8, 9, and 10 who was born impotent from his mother's womb, had never walked. Notice what changed his life. The same hard Paul. The hard Paul preach. So if he, if he did not hear Paul on that day, his condition would remain the same. Somebody is hearing me this morning and your life is about to change. Yeah. Oh, come on now. I say somebody's life is about to change right now. Yeah. Now, let me say this to you. Your life as it is today is as a result of what you have heard or what you have failed to hear. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Your life today is as a result of what you have heard or something that you failed to hear. In other words, if there are things you ought to hear that you are not hearing, it's going to affect your life. And in the same way, if there are things you ought not to be hearing that you are hearing, it is going to affect your life. It is going to affect your life. I want to show you a parable. I want to take you to the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ in you will find it in Matthew's account, chapter 13. You'll also find it in Mark's account, chapter 4. 
And then you'll also find it in Luke's account, chapter 8. That's Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. But I want us to look at Luke's account of it. Let's look at Luke. Glory to God. You know, Brother Copeland would say, you know, normally when you're trying to recite the books of the New Testament, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, at John. <laughs> Glory to God. It will help you know those books in their order. So in, in Luke's account, we're going to read from verse, Jesus has spoken about the parable. I'm sure you, uh, you, know, you know the parable, but let me not assume. So uh, that's why we're in church. We've got to read it in detail. I wanted us to start from the explanation, but let's read the story itself. Luke uh, chapter 8, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking, and it came about after a short time, I'm reading from verse 1, that he went through town and country, giving the good news of God, and within were the twelve, and certain women who had been made from evil spirits and diseases, or I'm reading from Bible in basic English, so let me come to the King James Bible. Glory to Jesus. And so... Uh, Let's read from verse 4 now. And when more people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he, he spake by a parable from verse 5. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, notice and pay attention now, he says, some fell by the wayside. So that's category 1. Number 2, he says, and he was trodden down and the fowls of the air devoured it. 6, showing us the second category in verse 6. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Verse 7, it should throw a category, and some fell among thorns. And he says, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Verse 8 says, the fourth category, and other fell on good ground. That's my ground. <laughs> <laughs> and sprang up and bare fruit and hundredfold. In other words, fulfilled his maximum potential. Maximum potential. Did you see now? And so, the Lord Jesus told this parable. Notice there is one sower, but there are four different kinds of grounds. In other words, four different responses. Can you see? But the same sower, same seed. You're going to see now. Same sower, same seed. Now, he says to us, this is a parable. Parables need explanation. Now, the good news is, every parable Jesus told, Jesus explained. It's amazing. And that's why it takes a miracle that heaven cannot understand when people pounce on the parables of Jesus and make it say what they want it to say. Heaven is amazed. Angels are shocked. That what? And I'll tell you, when you also understand the meaning of parables, you will be shocked too. You know why? I'll tell you. A parable is simply a fictitious story. In other words, do you know what fiction is? Something that did not happen. It's like you're talking to someone and you say, let's just say, let's assume, you, like a made-up story. That is, it's not real. But you made it up in order to buttress or explain something real. So the story itself is not real, that, that is a parable. But you are using it to illustrate something real. What that means, therefore, is if I'm the one who made up the parable in my head, that only I know what it means. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Now, I don't know where you grew up, but if you grew up where I grew up, the way children should grow up, do you notice that when children are, say, four, five, six, seven year old, they make up a lot of stories. They like to talk stories, you know, things that didn't happen. But, you know, now, the child is not being a liar. It's just the, the creative juices in that boy or that girl that is coming alive. So the imaginations, the imaginative power. So you see, I just make up a story and, you know, and sometimes you see they even do what, you know, they bring things and they start assuming that this chair is a person. Did you do that? Did you grow up at all? Or did you just appear on the earth? Oh, I did a lot of that growing up. Do you see? I remember one of the things I did growing up at some point in my life, maybe I was maybe eight or nine. I would take the sofa, you know, or the, the, we used to call it cushion. I don't know what you call it in your house. You know, and I would line them around, and I would begin to release power on them. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they never fell. I made them fall. <laughs> and when I'm done with the service, then I go to wrestling. 
And I ring them again, the same congregation. And I turn them to a wrestling ring. I don't know those people that you watch. When I was growing up, the people were ringing in wrestling were all Kogan. So, you know, well, boy. You guys are making me look like I'm old now. Some of you don't even know who the Hulk Hogan is. Hulk Hogan, you know, uh, uh, no, there are many, the other that you know is not the one that we knew. Uh, you know, and then we'll go, you know the way they will jump there, they will go to the top of the ring, then they will fly. And then I will go somewhere in the center table of the sitting room, then I will fly on those things. Wah! Then I will count. One, two, God forbid now that at your age you do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, when we were kids, we did all those things because we were just playing with our imaginations. Yes, 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 yes. You know, I remember last night, my, uh, you know, mom asked, you know, our son, and she said, because sometimes he, he takes some of his toys and then he's just, he's so lost in that world and he's just, and he just do all those things. And she asked, and I said, what, what actually is going on in your head when you are doing these things? <laughs> And that's the power of imagination. Now, imagine you see him doing all those things. You cannot interpret what he's doing. Because only he knows what he's doing. Because what he's doing is in his head. That's the way a parable is. He's in the head of the teller of the parable. And so if you ever will get the meaning of that parable, go to the person who told it. So he's like asking Jesus, what's the imagination in your mind that made you say this story? And he tells us what a loving Jesus he is. <laughs> Glory to God. So Jesus now said in verse 5. Okay, sorry, we've read that. So in verse uh, uh, 9, and his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? The disciples were very good students. They didn't assume. So they asked him, what might this parable be? And I was, you've told us something, but tell us, what do you mean by all these things? And that would mean they're asking, what does the seed represent? What does the ground represent? Did you see that now? So, verse 10, and he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He said, but to others in parables. In other words, you're going to tell it to those you choose to. And those who are close to you. So everybody else went home hearing a parable, not knowing the meaning. But Jesus says, to you guys, it's given to you to know. I'm going to tell you what this thing means. And so he now begins to tell them. And verse 11, he says, now, the parable is this. He is the one who has the power to tell us what it is. So he says, the seed is what? Come on, come on, read your Bible. The seed is what? So what is the seed? The word of God. Who said so? Come on now, who said so? Jesus. So what that means now is, the seed in this parable is not a seed that you can relate to in life. It's not a mango seed. It's not real. But it is used to describe the word of God, which is real. So, in other words now, because we live in a very crazy generation. Before one pastor somewhere will come up and say, there is this seed. If you eat it, you have eaten the word of God. When Jesus said seed, he used that seed as a parable, meaning there is no seed known to man that is called the word of God. I don't know. Did you get what I mean? You can't find it on any farm. Because if we had that kind of seed, why read the Bible? We just go and get it and sow it in our compound. And the word of God will be growing in our backyard. <laughs> now, what that means, therefore, is that parables are not literal. So that seed is not a literal seed. That is not something physical. He made it up in order to use it to explain a reality. And the reality in this case now is what? The word of God. So that's why I said the seed. And I was saying, the seed I'm talking about in my parable, I'm using that seed to describe what? The word of God. So what that means is the word of God is like a what? A seed. Let me rub your neighbor's shoulder gently. Say, neighbor, I have a big concern this morning. Your ignorance. <laughs> 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 so,
So the word of God is like what? Did you see that? So we understand what that is now in this story. So let's keep going. So he says in verse 12, those by the wayside are they that what? That's why we came here. They are those that what? So it means by the wayside in that parable is description of people and their approach to the word of God. Did you see that now? So it says, they by the wayside, or those by the wayside, verse 12, are they that what? Here. And I want you to pay attention to that. Then come at the devil and take it away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be. Does that tell you something? That therefore this parable is about salvation. He says, they hear. Then immediately they heard it, the devil comes, takes the word away from their heart, so that they don't believe it and be saved. Jesus, in that simple explanation, tells you how humanity works. He will hear the word. The word gets into his heart. He believes it with his heart, and therefore he's saved. So why did the devil come against that man? He doesn't want him to be what? To be saved. But where did the process of his salvation begin? It began with his hearing. With his hearing. Let's see the second category. Verse 13. They on the road are they with what? When they. Do you see something common to the first category and the second category? They both heard. He said they receive the word with joy. And these have no root. Which for a while believe. And in time of temptation, what happens to them? Jesus says they what? They fall away. Why is it that they couldn't go far? Number one, he said, they believed only for a while because they have no root in them. Did you see that? Let's go to the third category, 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have what? Do you see something coming to all three of them now? They all heard. They go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And bring no fruit to perfection. Did you see that? The first one didn't get saved. The second one fell away. Because he has no root. The third one. Is rooted. But is not bringing forth fruit. Why? Because he's choked. By what? The cares of this life. Let's go to the fourth one. But that, verse 15, on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. Did you see? Having what now? Did you see this is common to all four? They all did what? But you know something is very interesting. The first and second ground, he says, when they hear. The third and fourth, he puts it in past tense, heard. Are you here this morning? Yeah. <laughs> the different kinds of hearing. No wonder Jesus said, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Now, this is about salvation. I'll help you simply. The first two are not saved. The last two are saved. One is not fruitful. The other is fruitful. That's what this parable is about. But what is common to all these four different categories is that they all heard. In other words, the hearing is a major factor. The hearing is a major factor. The hearing is a major factor. So you see again that it's a big issue in life. Won't listen. When people won't listen or won't listen or pay attention well, you know, this generation is one of the most, if not the most, distracted generation ever. Ever. Because it's interesting to know that the same way it works with salvation is the same way it works with every other thing you would do with God. Your hearing is important. So you must guard your hearing. Tell three people around you, tell them, say, guard your hearing. Guard your hearing. Guard your hearing. Guard your hearing. 
You've got to guard your hearing. God delights in speaking to us. He is a revealer. We said that last week. He is not a concealer. God is a revealer. God reveals. God loves speaking to us, his children. Did you see? So, but we must learn how to listen. And one of the things we saw last week, Sunday, is that you must learn to quiet your soul. Learn to quiet your soul. Learn to quiet your soul. I'll say this for the sake of repetition and emphasis. Divine leading comes from stillness. That is from quietness. Divine leading comes from stillness or quietness. You must be still. In Psalm 23 verse 2, he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He leadeth me beside still waters. And so understand your soul is involved in the process of hearing God. In Psalm 130 verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. Notice he said, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. My soul doth wait. So when a person says they're waiting upon the Lord, their soul has to be involved. You got to understand what your soul is. Your soul is not you, but your soul is a part of you. And I dare say your soul is a very vital part of you. That's where you have your mind. Did you see? That's where your emotions are. That's where your will is. In your soul. You know, this is basic, basic pneumatology. Did you see? Man is a spirit. Man has a soul and man lives in the body. So man is not a body. You are not a body. Your body is just where you live. The real you is a spirit man. That spirit lives inside this physical frame called your body. And there is, a, there is a particular order of priority in the makeup of man. The spirit is the most important. Then the soul. Then the body. I'll say it again. The right order is your spirit first, then your soul then your body. Not the other way around. Your body is not as important as your spirit. Your body is not as important as your soul. You must take care of all three, but understand which is the most important. And not only is it the most important, it is the center of your life, your spirit man. You see, when a person is dead, they say he's dead because his body is lifeless. Why is his body lifeless? The real man inside has left. So you see, I always like to explain this over the years. Death does not mean the end of life. In any way, it doesn't. Death simply means separation. So there is spiritual death, there is physical death. Spiritual death is when the spirit of a man is disunited from God. So the man who is not saved is called dead. Ephesians 2.1. Did you see he said, we were dead in our trespasses and our sins. Did you see that? Not, not because you are not physically living, but because you are without God. So the Bible speaks of spiritual death as when a man, that is the spirit, is separated from God's spirit. So that separation is the key thing there when you talk about death. Now, in the same way, physical death is when the body of a man is separated from his spirit. So when they say somebody died, what it simply means is that their spirit has been disunited from his body. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? And that does not mean he has ceased to exist. Oh, you better believe it. It is appointed once for man to die. He said, but after that one, there is judgment. So he's telling you that after that man dies physically, his life doesn't end there. Because you don't judge somebody that doesn't exist. Hebrews 9. It's appointed once for man to die and after that there is judgment. So it means when the man dies physically he is going to exist somewhere else where he will not be held accountable. So it means there is an existence outside of this physical life. 
You know, I've seen some very dumb human beings say, I don't all this gospel Christian born again thing. I don't care about it. Let's just live our life. There's no life after this one. Just die and go. And that will be the end. Well, you are waiting for a root shock. Or a root shock is waiting for you. Because the moment people slip out of this realm of existence, they step into another one. And at that point, it is too late to want to hear the gospel again. Is somebody hear what I'm saying now? You know, that's why as believers, our ministry essentially is to go and tell the world there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. I'll say it again. There is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. Tell somebody, I'm not sure your neighbor can hear you. So there is a heaven to gain and there is a hell to shun. That's the reason why I say when you begin to understand these things, you'll never be afraid of death. Are you, are you scared of death? Not, not saying you should die now, no. Why are you afraid of death? It's not going to be scared of. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Absolutely nothing. And I mean absolutely nothing. Because there is another life after that. For a believer, when a believer dies, he just steps out of this realm into a better realm. Instantly, sir. Instantly, sir. Some Christians will only realize that there was nothing to fear in death after they have died. But for the guy who is not in Christ, he must be afraid of death. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah 14, it says, hell from beneath awaited thee. You don't understand what that means. Hell is waiting for him. Oh, but glory, hell is not waiting for us. You know, over the years, when I have to travel by air, I watch how people are really afraid when the plane is about to take off. And you see them pretending to be reading newspaper. It's a lie. <laughs> I wanted to always say to myself, even when there's turbulence, I would just say to myself, look, worst case scenario, if anything happens, last, last, I will open my eyes and the angels are waiting there. So why now torment yourself for what will not even happen anyway? At least not at this time. Because the major fear of man is the fear of death. Otherwise, I'm afraid of flying. No, flying is not your fear. Your fear is what could happen as a result of flying, which is death. So don't lie on flying. You see, people, they don't ever want to go near a swimming pool. The water is not your... See, that's how you know that that water was not the real, real issue because you still baited with water this morning. <laughs> so the reason why you're afraid of the pool is because you're afraid of death. So enter this pool and swim. Tell them, I say, no fear here. No fear. If I leave your neighbor alone, say it by yourself. Say, no fear here. No fear. No fear. Let me say it the way you should say it. I fear nothing. I fear nothing. <laughs> you don't want to grow old enough and then realize that you didn't live life to the fullest because you were afraid. Live life. Stop, Stop being scared. Afraid of driving. Afraid of flying. Psychologists say most of the fears of man are irrational. Because much of it will never happen. So what are you afraid of? Afraid of marriage. Afraid of school. Some are afraid of abroad. <laughs> Can you imagine? Some are afraid of pro prosperity. Say, I don't want to buy slide. Oh Lord. Not me, sir. <laughs> My position on that, the Lord, prove me here with, sir. <laughs> and I will show you the holiest man ever. <laughs> say it again. Say, no fear here. No fear here. So understand basic pneumatology. You are a spirit. When you got born again, your spirit came alive. But you at e quicken, Ephesians 2 1, who were dead. To be quickened means he made us alive. When you are carnally minded and you're looking at the man physically and you hear that story, you're wondering, how does a man who is physically breathing come alive? It's because you are not looking at the real man. It is the man on the inside that came alive. I'm alive now. Oh, I'm alive now. I'm alive now. I'm one with God. Glory to God. <laughs>